ongoing support for the OMA History Speaker Series. Thank you to the OMA History Committee for their work behind the scenes to recruit our excellent speakers to coordinate and execute all moving parts that make these talks happen. And to Deanne McCallumat Rogers for recording our history speakers for viewing on Rogers Table, enabling us to share our talks with a wider audience. Our speaker tonight is Dave Dawson, community editor for Aurelia Matters. Our talk this evening is Evolution, Packet's death spawns birth of digital newspaper. The Aurelia Packet and Times was near and dear to our hearts. We depended on the paper to keep us updated on the community. And in November, 2017, it was killed off with no notice. Thank you, Dave, for sharing your story about the death and rebirth of good journalism in our community. So a quick bio about Dave. He was born and raised in Aurelia, a centennial baby. He grew up in a home at the south end of Machadash Street, the youngest of five kids. He went to Central School, Harriet Todd Public School, Kuchijing Heights Public School, and ODCVI. After graduating from University of Windsor in 1990, he became a reporter and editor for the, uh-oh, Amherstburg Echo. I hope I got that right, Dave. Before returning to Aurelia in November of 1991 to become a sports reporter for the Packet and Times. He soon became the Packet sports editor, then served as a night editor city editor and news editor before leaving to become a freelance journalist. But he never really left writing and editing for the local daily newspaper uh, regularly until its untimely demise in 2017. In 2018, he became the community editor of Aurelia Matters. And while he continues in that role, he also is the regional editor for Village Media, overseeing sites in Barrie, Collingwood, Midland, Bradford, Innisfil, and Newmarket. So over to you, Dave. Well, thanks so much, Hannah. I appreciate the uh, the introduction and thanks for having me. Um, I was at an event in Aurelia a little while ago, and as happens at these types of things, I struck up a conversation with someone I didn't know. After she learned I was the editor of Aurelia Matters, she asked me about my journey to this role. Naturally, I told her with pride that I'd started at the packet, where I learned the ropes and began to hone my craft. She had a bit of a blank look on her face, and she asked, what is the packet? Her question was a bit of a punch to the gut. In my world, the packet is like a touchstone, an important part of my history and the heritage of this strange and wonderful place called Aurelia. But it made me quickly realize that time marches on. And for some, the packet has already faded from the headline, so to speak. But let's start with the packet. As many of you will know, the Packet and Times was what we proudly called the newspaper of record in Aurelia for generations. It started in 1867 as the Expositor by George Hughes Hale, among others, and became the Northern Light just a year later. The name The Packet made its first appearance on November 16, 1870, under William M. Hale, and originated from that same office as the Northern Light. Later, the Hale brothers joined forces and continued to publish the packet from the same office. The Aurelia Times became the small community's third paper and operated as a newspaper until H.T. Blackstone purchased it in 1890. It was then carried on by his son, George. In 1926, the Times and the packet merged. The Aurelia Packet and Times was owned and edited by Charles Harold Hale, and James Russell Hale and Blackstone. It was the dawn of a new era in the little town on two lakes. C.H. Hale's name quickly became synonymous with Aurelia. His association with journalism in Aurelia spanned 65 years. He started out as what was known as a printer's devil and rose to become editor. He championed many causes and according to the Aurelia Hall of Fame of which he is an esteemed member, Hale maintained a high standard of ethical journalism, never stooping to sensationalism. His editorials were widely read across Canada. But after the Second World War, the Hale brothers sold the paper to J.T. Dutrezac, and in 1950, the corporate ownership era began when Thompson Newspapers bought the paper. It became a daily newspaper finally on November 5, 1953. It was a banner day in the life of the packet and Aurelia. In 1967, exactly 100 years after its birth, the packet moved into its new modern custom-built home on Coburn Street, a two-story landmark in downtown Aurelia that still stands today. From there, 
two editions were published daily for more than 30,000 readers in Aurelia, Northern Simcoe County, and Muskoka. Believe it or not, copies were mailed throughout Canada, the United States, Africa, Britain, and continental Europe. Back then, more than 50 employees worked in seven distinct departments at the packet. Editorial, classified and displayed advertising, administration, circulation, composing, and press. The common goal of each department was to get the news to its readers. It was a time when the paper was delivered usually by kids and teens, to almost every household in town. It was a highly anticipated ritual to read the paper at around the dinner hour each day. In those pages, the history of the town unfolded. Legends were born and destroyed. If it wasn't in the packet, it didn't happen. That was the packet I grew up knowing. My parents, like most, subscribed to the packet and were voracious readers each day. My parents also owned a cleaning company in town, and one of their longtime commercial clients was the packet. And that's how I was introduced to the bustling business at 31 Coburn Street East. As a young lad, I would go with my parents and siblings after hours to help them clean various places, including the packet. Most of those places were dark and devoid of people. The packet was different. There were always people there, no matter the time of the day or night. To me, a lover of sports who followed all the local teams through their coverage in the packet, it seemed like a magical place. When you walked into the building, you could smell the ink. If the presses were running, you could feel their vibrations throughout the building. You could feel an energy in the air. I remember watching the ticker tape spew out of a wall on the second floor, bringing stories to Aurelia from all over the world. The language in the newsroom in those days was colorful. The intensity was high. I remember talking to sports editor Steve Milton and being in awe. It was during those days that journalism seeped into my blood. It got a hold of me. I knew then what I wanted to do with my life. A few years later at ODCVI, teacher Marilyn McCarroll, among others, nurtured that passion. They supported my goals and provided constructive feedback. After studying journalism and graduating from the University of Windsor, I got my first job as a reporter at a family-owned weekly newspaper. At the Emmitsburg Echo, I was given the opportunity to learn all facets of the business, and I mean all of them. Once a week, reporters, editors, and everyone else would head down to the basement and insert flyers into the papers that had just been printed. Then, each in our personal cars, we would head out to various parts of town delivering that week's news. A few months after I became an editor of a new regional paper, The Echo started, and 18 months after I started in Amherstburg, I got one of those phone calls. It was my dad. He told me the Packet and Times was looking for a sports editor. Frankly, I was reluctant to return home. Like so many people, I couldn't wait to get out of Aurelia when I finished high school. So I decided I would apply, and if I got the job, we'd stay for a year or a year and a half. After all, I had big dreams of becoming a beat writer for the Toronto Maple Leafs or perhaps the Blue Jays. But something funny happened. We had kids and we fell back in love with Aurelia. And the packet, home to unreasonable demands amid a constant and critical shortage of staff, was that weird mix of egos and talent and dreams and passion that just somehow worked. Part of it was the shared common passion for our work in our community. We felt we were doing something important, even vital in the name of democracy and ensuring accountability of those who were in positions of power locally. Over my first several years at the packet, I was the sports editor and headed up what those in the business jokingly called the toy department. That meant working a lot of nights and weekends to cover games and tournaments. It meant traveling throughout the region as our hockey and lacrosse teams, most notably Chase Glory. I had a front row seat at the city's biggest sports events and was fortunate to chronicle the ups and downs of our city's top athletes. Equally important, I got to tell the stories of the volunteers who made those things happen, of the high school student who had big league dreams, watched elementary school students fall in love with their chosen sport. In some cases, I witnessed young athletes come of age as they pursued their passions. But over time, I decided it was time to move over into the real world of news. At first, I became night editor, the guy who edits late breaking news and lays out the primary news pages of the paper. It was a difficult role, in part because it meant I had to work from 4 p.m. to midnight. 
but it also allowed me to have my fingerprints on the most important stories and news pages in every edition. Then I became assignment editor, the guy who was responsible for coming up with giving each reporter enough assignments to keep them busy during their workday. It was also my job to call audibles, to send reporters as necessary to cover breaking news or change gears completely and chase something that suddenly had become more important. After that, I became the city editor, overseeing all aspects of the newsroom. In each job, there were different responsibilities, but one overarching task, to cover everything relevant at every moment, even as our numbers dwindled. And why were those numbers dwindling? Why was our newsroom, like newsrooms all over the country, shrinking? Were we not doing our job? Unfortunately, the answer has almost nothing to do with what we as reporters and editors were doing. It had everything to do with an industry rooted in traditions, an industry simply unwilling to adapt while intent on squeezing every single cent out of every single newspaper with absolutely no regard for the product those communities relied on. The packet was a microcosm of the entire industry. It started out as a family owned enterprise driven by passion. It became something vital through the blood, sweat and tears of the people who worked there. It became enmeshed in the fabric of the community and was part of its culture. Loved, hated, ridiculed, revered, sometimes all on the same day. However people felt, they knew it was important to read the packet. It employed a lot of people over the years, sponsored almost everything, championed the causes important to the community, and held those in power to account. If not for the packet, would the community have rallied to build a home for fire victim Joey Filion, turning a local story into an international one? Would the community have come together like never before to rebuild the Leacock Boathouse on a memorable weekend in 1995 without the packet rallying people to the cause? Conversely, would it have taken decades to build a new recreation facility if the packet wasn't constantly criticizing the process or the site or the politics? The multi-use recreation facility or MRF debate dragged on for years and years, at least in part due to the packet's persistent and important coverage of the issues related to it. If the packet never caught wind of the controversial plan to build a giant garbage burning incinerator in the community, might that have happened? The fact is the packet was a major player in our community in what happened and in what didn't happen. There were times when that power was likely exploited. Some thought we were too big for our britches or too negative or too self-important. They might've been right. But there was always a belief within the packet that what we were doing was vital. We didn't always agree internally about certain stances or certain approaches, but we tried to take the approach of looking at the bigger picture and what was most important to the community at large over the long run. However, those that own the packet could care less about what we might call this noble pursuit. From Thompson, notoriously cheap owners who accounted for every pencil, to Hollinger, to Osprey, to Post Media, and others whose names I can't even remember, their only concern was making money. Those owners, generally speaking, had an aversion for adaptation. They were entrenched in their past. Their only strategy was to cut cut and cut some more. It became an almost annual event. Darkness would descend in November as newsrooms braced for cutbacks. Naturally, that climate had a major impact on everyone who toiled in our industry and specifically at the packet. People lost heart, frustration rose, anger boiled. Many just were waiting for a buyout. Hope was seeping out the doors. For me, that toxic work culture became too much. And in 2005, I decided I had to get out, sort of. I quit my full-time job as editor and became a freelancer. But I kept my foot in the door at the packet with a regular Sunday editor shift and a new role as a freelance reporter while also doing freelance work for a variety of other entities. For me, it was a risky decision, but one that felt like a shot of pure oxygen. I felt like I could breathe again. And while I loved my new roles outside of the packet, I also knew at some level, I could never divorce myself from the city's newspaper. During those freelance years, 
the staff at the packet shrunk dramatically. Ironically, that meant more opportunities for me, and I found myself increasingly doing more and more work at the packet, albeit while working from home and having control over my work life. We were probably the only newspaper in Canada whose editorials were written by a freelancer, me. The cutback trend, however, was happening all over the country. At that time, a handful of large corporations owned almost every newspaper in Ontario. And almost every newspaper was failing, losing market share, losing their footing. It was no different in Aurelia. The corporate owners had long ago removed the packet's all-important presses in a cost-cutting measure. The packet was printed in Vaughan for years, forcing us to change our optimal morning deadline to a 10 p.m. deadline. That meant when people read their afternoon newspaper, the news was older and more stale than at any time in the packet's history. In another cost-cutting move prescribed by bottom-line-driven owners, the packet sold its downtown landmark building and moved into a strip mall. It was symbolically, at least, demoralizing and disheartening. The good ship packet was in peril. As you may recall, the packet was at one time printed twice a day and reached up to 30,000 people daily in the region. More than 50 people worked together to make what people in the industry called the daily miracle. In the final days of the packet, circulation had plummeted. Less than 3,500 people were paying to read the packet in 2017. The newsroom was down to two full-time people. Over the years, the packet went from being published seven days a week to just five at the end. The owners had taken a vibrant, vitally important community resource and systematically bled it dry. It was a sad shell of its once powerful past. Despite that, I'm not sure how many people thought the packet would close overnight. I certainly didn't believe that was possible. Yet when I woke up on November 27, 2017, I did what I always did. I checked my work email account. Oddly, I could not access it. I assumed it was a technical issue and decided to check it later. As was my habit, I called up Twitter on my phone to get caught up on the news. And that is when I found out that I and so many of my colleagues and peers in the province were out of work. Metroland and Post Media had decided to turn its properties into a giant monopoly board of sorts. Post Media opted to sell the packet along with other deeply rooted papers in Barrie, Collingwood, and many other communities to Torstar. Because Torstar operated papers, mostly weekly papers, in those markets, they promptly closed the dailies like the packet. And we, the employees, found out about our fate on social media. Perhaps even worse, the move was immediate. There was no chance for a final edition or a farewell. The doors were locked. The paper was dead. In Aurelia, it felt it left a community in shock. People were outraged. During a wake organized by then Mayor Steve Clark at Brewery Bay a few days later, some in the community were moved to tears to be without their paper and their voice. They say you never miss what you have until it's gone. That was certainly the case with the packet. While many had stopped subscribing and grew frustrated with how it had withered, there was still a deeply seated affection for the paper or for what it once was. That same loss of, was being felt in communities all, all over Ontario and beyond. And sadly, it went way beyond newspapers. As this was happening, most radio stations and TV stations were experiencing similar economic storms. It is rare these days for a small radio station to have a, a news reporter on staff. They often have newscasts, but they don't do any original reporting. They essentially read headlines from other sources. Similarly, many TV stations had been shuttered or scaled back. Big networks spend big bucks on national news coverage, but very few had local reporters in small communities like Aurelia. But at least we had another paper, right? The Aurelia Today had been a weekly paper published in Aurelia for years. It was owned and operated by Torstar's affiliate, Metroland, who had promised to commit resources to such papers when they shut down those historic dailies. Guess what? The opposite happened. Until recently, Aurelia Today had just one reporter. Now, they don't even have that. And they stopped their print edition and moved entirely online. But they only pay lip service to community news. How could they do otherwise with no staff? It's what we can accurately be called a perfect storm a horrible situation only rendered possible because of greedy owners who failed to change and endorsed a strategy that consisted of cutting employees, selling buildings, 
regionalizing everything and failing to recognize a landscape that had irrevocably changed. But from misery comes opportunity. An opportunity in this case was Village Media. Village Media's publicly stated goal is to strengthen the communities it serves. Think about that for a minute in the context of the approach and ethics of previous owners of the packet. When it really matters got off to such a strong start, Village Media recognized in us a success story, one that could be replicated. So as part of their partnership with Google, Google sent a five person production team from New York City to Aurelia for three weeks. The goal was to capture that success story. Told the city stories for 147 years. There's not a person that you could talk to who wouldn't have something to say about how it touched their life. And I remember going into the newsroom as a young boy, and I kind of thought it was a noble pursuit to be telling people stories. That's when something inside me kind of clicked that there might be something in the future there for me. 26 years I worked there. I never went a day with my byline not being in the paper. That That was like a badge of honor to me because a daily newspaper in a community this size just becomes bigger than just a newspaper. But even though the engagement level is so high, there was never talk about growth or investing. It was all just about how can we save another dollar? How can we cut another person? And when we sold our presses and moved to a strip mall, that showed that we were going in the wrong direction. And when we found out that the paper was closing, it was devastating. It was personally devastating. You know, I was at an age where I was like, what am I going to do um, career-wise? What's the community going to do without a daily newspaper? It was where they turned to find the big stories, the little stories, the news from the council chambers, the hockey score, an obituary. It was how people found out that people died. I mean, that's just the reality. So when that important news source is suddenly sucked away and there's nothing there, people really recognized what they were missing. What was happening was not acceptable in our community. There had to be a place where they make quality local news effectively and profitably. That's when I heard about Village Media and Jeff Elgy, who's the owner of the company. Village Media is a digital-only publishing company focused on local news media. People still want that information about their community that they have always got. What's been disrupted is where they get it from. So to us, it's, hey, let's take these great people, this great content, and, and move it over into this business model. So in really, we were fortunate enough to be able to uh, connect with the publisher from that daily paper, some of the regional reporters, and Dave, their regional editor, we work with Google in particular with their tools that can enable newsrooms to do much more powerful things that were never possible before. Hey, guys. And so we say, look, there's a set of tools for you. So you don't have to worry about anything other than writing a great story, which you've always done. And I think for journalists, when they're focused on writing, they love it. And so we knew that the conditions were, were right. And we had confidence in the people. And, and so it was... Let's do this. And within a month of the paper closing, we launched It Really Matters. When we launched, our numbers were really strong. I could tell right away we were really on to something here. People were coming to our site in droves every day, every hour, every half hour. It just blew me away. I had a friend of mine yesterday saying, I don't miss the newspaper anymore. Everything I need is right there at It Really Matters. And it's there quicker. I can get it easier. The paper doesn't get caught in my snowblower. Um, <laughs> I always thought, uh, you know, I would die a newspaper guy. But this new chapter has created something awesome. I think the future is brighter than we thought. Perfect. Thank you. As I said in that video, something awesome has happened thanks to Village Media. Later this month, Village Media will open its 25th site devoted to local news when Aurora Today goes online. Village Media is one of the few media companies in Canada that is expanding and hiring. How is that possible? 
It's possible due to visionary owner Jeff LG, whom you just met in the video, and to a strategy that puts news gathering above everything else. That might be best explained by the Aurelia Matter story. As you may recall, publication of the packet ceased on November 25, 2017. It came out of nowhere, taking everyone by surprise. Yet Aurelia Matters went live online on January 1st, 2018, just 36 days later. That is a remarkably short period of time to essentially start a new newspaper from scratch. It's a testament to a company that is nimble and built to grow. You know, it was scary in a way. However, it also felt like we had nothing to lose. So we put our heads down and we got to work. We started with John Hamill as publisher, Nicole Parks as a sales rep, myself as editor, and Nathan Taylor as a reporter. Each of us had deep roots in the packet. And I'm proud to say today that all four of us are still here working hard. But we, we are certainly not alone. Village Media had custom built a content management system that is light years ahead of everyone else. On top of that, there is support staff at the company's headquarters in Sault Ste. Marie that help not only with editorial function, but other uh, areas such as human resources, uh, legal, technology, and other important departments. Village Media found a way to create a model for digital newspapers that was frankly quite easy to replicate. And while each site is 100% autonomous with all decisions made at the local level, a winning formula has been developed through various sites that have found success in markets large and small all over the world. The critical part of that success is the hiring of local journalists, people who know the community they serve. And it really matters is the perfect example of that. One, one of the things that is a bit different about Village Media sites is that we print press releases that are submitted to us from community groups and organizations verbatim. We look at it as a service to the community. Having said that, just because we, we receive a press release does not mean we must publish it. We could choose not to, we could turn it into a story. It's up to the editor to decide those things. And while we mimic a newspaper in every way by covering city council, breaking news, political shenanigans, etc., we now know definitively what people like to read and try to provide that. That is likely one of the biggest differences between digital sites and old fashioned print newspapers. In the past, we never really knew how many people were reading what we wrote. Now, I can tell you how many people opened a story, how long on average people spent reading the story, how many photographs they looked at. The real time analytics are available and easily accessible. Through those analytics, we quickly realized that the most popular stories outside of police news and obituaries, were often stories about new businesses, new restaurants, or quirky stories. So when a new restaurant opens, we try to write a story about it. When there's a winter storm in April, we cover it. When the sign at Burger King blows over, we don't hesitate to write a story about it. As an aside, that one is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. A reader shot a 35 second video of the sign at Burger King blowing over and we added an 80 word story and the story was headlined wild wind a whopper for Aurelia Burger King sign. Ironically enough it was easily the most viewed story of the month and it proves a couple of things. A story doesn't have to be long and the theme doesn't have to be serious to garner readers attention. But I want to stress and I can't say this enough we don't chase analytics. We will never write clickbait headlines in an ill-conceived attempt to fool people into reading a story. Most importantly, we won't sacrifice the important stories for the popular ones. Coverage of um, city council is a good example of that. We are often the only news source covering a city council meeting these days. That frankly is scary and it should be worrisome to everyone. So we take that responsibility and it is very clearly a responsibility, seriously. We do our best to write fair, accurate, clear stories about every decision made at City Hall. Some of those stories, frankly, can be boring. 
Not everyone wants to read about wastewater treatment plants. And while I understand that, I believe that that type of story is important to write. Sure, sexy sells, but I like to think we're above that. We take our rule as seriously as we can. And that's why it's so important that the reporters and editors that bring you the news each day are trained and experienced and live in the community. That packet DNA lives within us. That rich heritage of vital journalism drives us. In our hearts and minds, Ray, Matter, Ray Matters is a newspaper in every important way. The difference really is simply how it's delivered and when it's available. It's delivered, of course, right to your phone or your iPad or your laptop or your computer, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. Yes, even on Christmas. Transformative technology is the key. Villager, a custom-made content management system, was developed in-house specifically for our news sites. It's easy to navigate, it's intuitive, and it almost never goes down. So what that means is a reporter can take photographs with his phone, write a story on his phone, and put it in our content management system on his phone. Depending on the reporter's experience level, he could publish that story to our site directly from the scene using his phone. However, more typically, an editor will edit it prior to publication. Think about that. Years ago, a photographer would take pictures and then head back to the darkroom to develop the film. A reporter would be on the scene doing interviews and then race back to the newsroom to write the story, all of which would likely be published in the next day's edition. Don't forget, you needed a whole other team of people to lay out the story in the paper, to make it fit around the ads in a confined space before it would be sent to another department that created plates that were then put on a press. Then it had to be printed. Then it had to be delivered. Think of how many steps are involved and how many people had their fingerprints on any given story back in the day. Today, thanks to this technology, we could publish a story within minutes of a major breaking event in the community. However, that is a bit of a double-edged sword. Being fast can sometimes mean being wrong. So we try to balance that need for speed with an underlying tenant that we must get it right. Even if that means someone else can post it first, accuracy and fairness are far more important to us than speed. We have also learned that to many of our readers, speed is overrated. Many of our readers are subscribers and wait until our email lands in their inbox at 3 p.m. to check out the news. At present, we have a little over 20,000 people who subscribe to our daily news newsletter, and we know from the click rates that most of them read Abrey Matters every day. Many of, me, many of them have told me that they view that as the newspaper. They take their time to go through all the news, the obituaries, the weather. Many do the Sudoku or crossword, just as they did in the days when the newspaper was put in their mailbox each afternoon. One of the other ways the digital news site is different from a legacy newspaper is the way in which our readers can interact with us, with our journalists, and with other readers. From the day we started, there were many varied voices weighing in on our stories via our, via our commenting mechanism. At first, most people were respectful, but to be honest, it was always a bit of a gong show. And then during the, the pandemic, things spiraled out of control. So on September 14th of 2021, we shut off the tap spewing gossip. It was the most controversial move we've made since we started publishing. Here's how I explained it in an editorial we published that day. The pandemic has brought out the best of people in many ways. Over the past 18 months, we've been heartened to share many of those stories. But as the coronavirus domination drags on, it is taking a toll in many different ways. Unfortunately, it seems to have robbed many of you of your common sense and your human decency. And sadly, that is all too often reflected in the hurtful comments you write, often under cowardly false pen names, below our stories. Many have nothing of value to say, but keep saying it over and over again, often at length 
and typically in hurtful and hateful language. We are all weary of ignorant ramblings, subtle but hurtful racism, and thinly and not so thinly veiled threats of violence. That ends today. We will no longer be a platform for toxicity and wild conspiracy theorists. This is not an easy decision in that we strive to present a variety of viewpoints and want to provide a place, a virtual water cooler of sorts, where people can safely discuss the matters of the moment. But try as we might, this is no longer a safe place. We have spent countless hours trying to moderate the growing number of comments and we do our best to filter out slurs of all sorts. However, many are just smart enough to find their way around such rules. While the comment sections are now gone, in their place at the bottom of our stories, you will find a new feedback option that prompts readers to add to the story. It allows you, dear reader, to enter a thoughtful response to the story you've just read. Submissions will be reviewed by local newsroom staff and a selection will be posted as part of a weekly roundup of reader feedback. But be forewarned, we will not publish prejudice or cheap shots and will not provide a platform for childish name calling or trolling. So don't waste your time. Of course, if you really want to weigh in on a local matter, feel free to do what readers have done for hundreds of years. Write a letter to the editor. As has been our policy since day one, we will only publish letters from real people with real names and identities we've confirmed via, via phone prior to publication. Frankly, it's a sad commentary that we must take this step. Our hope is that it also serves another purpose, allowing us to get on with what should be our top priority, informing you on the critical issues that face our community. After publishing that editorial for the first time, I was worried about what I'd written. Even though I knew it was the right thing to do, I was concerned that we might face an overwhelming backlash from people holding pitchforks and calling for freedom of speech. But perhaps surprisingly, the reaction was the opposite. Generally speaking, people applauded us for taking a stand and for removing that element of vitriol that turned our site into something ugly. Finally, in October of 2023, more than two years later, we introduced a new verified content a verified commenting system. Commenters who meet a specified criteria and continue to promote a respectful dialogue receive a virtual badge that allows them access to comment directly to the site. Readers who are not verified may still comment, but those comments will be manually moderated before appearing under story. When we introduced um, verified commenting, we wrote another editorial about the whole idea. And here's what we said. We won't tolerate name calling, personal attacks, trolling, or veiled prejudice. Users whose posts are derogatory, defamatory, or discriminatory should expect to be permanently and unceremoniously relieved of their commenting privileges by our moderators. Despite that verified commenting system, we still don't allow comments on court stories, police related stories, indigenous stories, and coverage of other marginalized groups. We also don't allow comments on letters to the editors to prevent debate from spiraling down deep, dark rabbit holes. The good news is, generally speaking, verified commenting is working. It's not perfect, and we're constantly tweaking it, but the toxicity level, thankfully, has decreased dramatically. We've, we've talked a lot about journalism today. Now I'd like to focus a bit on the business model as I think it's important at this point to explain the revenue expense formula that Village Media has successfully employed since it began more than a decade ago. First off, we are a private company and we are not government funded. We do not receive subsidies from the government. However, we do have a few reporters across our network who are part of what's known as the Local Journalism Initiative. That is a federal government program aimed to provide funding for what's known as news deserts. We have to apply for these positions and make a case for the funding. It is an excellent program. For example, we have a civics reporter at our Midland Today site. He can only cover municipal issues in Midland, Penetanguishene, Tay, and Tiny Township. He can't, for example, go cover a fire or a murder. 
Outside of those parameters, the federal government has absolutely no say in what the reporter covers, and they are not involved in any way with what that reporter does every day. I think it's really important that you understand as well that Village Media is adamant that there will never be a paywall on its local news sites. That is born from a desire to make local news accessible to everyone on an equal basis. We will never force you to pay for, to access Array Matters. So how do we keep the lights on? It's simple, advertising. We have sales reps out working hard to sell ads and campaigns that fund the gathering of news. So when you see an ad pop up when you're reading a story, it would be helpful if you clicked on that ad. That is what keeps us going. But there are other revenue streams, such as programmatic sales through a partnership with Google. There are what's known as community leaders programs that are sold to local businesses to support stories around a given theme, such as bold or pursuit or helpers. You can find example of those on our site. Just click on the tab called more to the right of news and you will see those stories. It's important to understand the advertiser doesn't have any say in that content. They don't get to pick the stories and they certainly don't get to read them before they're published. There's one thing we don't accept payment for, obituaries. I think we're the only entity on the planet that does not charge for the publication of obituaries. Once, when our company put out a call to staff for new ideas to make money, I suggested we charge a nominal fee for obituaries. At that time, it wasn't long after my mom had died, and I was shocked at how expensive it was, for example, to have an obituary published in Aurelia today. But our owner, Jeff Elgie, said he would not try to profit from those who were grieving. He also pointed out that on any given day, the most read section of our sites was the obituaries. They draw readers to our site every day. We also have a lot less expenses than legacy media. We almost all work from our home, though Arroyo Matters does have a small office in downtown Arroyo. The cost of real estate for a company is very low. We also don't need presses or people to lay out the stories because every editorial employee is equipped with a phone, a laptop, and a camera. Quite honestly, we don't need much else. The most important takeaway from all of this, I think, is that investing in journalism and journalists works. It's profitable. While other companies shrunk dramatically during the pandemic, our growth continues. In fact, the number of staff at Village Media has more than doubled in recent years. We now employ 160 people and 58% of those staff members are on the editorial side of the business. That is unheard of in our industry. It's, it's a winning formula and something we know and can prove with tangible numbers. We track the traffic on each of our sites. Now, to be honest, numbers are down a little bit since Facebook decided to remove Canadian news from its social media site. The most important metric we use is what's known as page views. So each time a person opens a story, that is considered a page view. In April, Aurelia Matters had 2.1 million page views. Now that does not mean 2.1 million people came to our site, but it means that people opened 2.1 million stories to read. Aurelia Matters is consistently the fifth highest read site among the 24 in our network. The only sites that have more page views on a monthly basis are much older than us and in much bigger centers, Sault Ste. Marie, Sudbury, North Bay, and Guelph. The reality is, from the day we started in 2018, Aurelia Matters has been very well received in the community. Both advertisers and readers have been excellent, faithful supporters. And that has paved the way for growth at our site and well beyond. Today at Aurelia Matters, I continue to serve as community editor and we have two full-time reporters. We have another desk editor, several well-respected columnists that represent a wide array of voices and many freelancers. When Aurelia Matters started in 2018, Village Media's only site in our region was buried today. That site had been up and running for a few years, but only had one full-time staffer. They were simply trying to establish themselves in one of Ontario's largest markets. But as Aurelia took off, the company decided it was time to beef up the berry market and expanded and expand throughout Simcoe County. Today, 
Barry Today has a full-time editor and four full-time reporters, along with its own stable of columnists and freelancers. In April, Barry Today had more than 1.4 million page views. We also opened sites in Collingwood, Bradford, Newmarket, Midland, and Innisfil. I serve as the regional editor overseeing all seven sites. I'm happy to say that now on the news side, we have a total complement of 21 full-time reporters and editors working hard to tell the important stories in each of those communities. And it's not hyperbole to say we are now the dominant media outlet in each of those seven markets. Looking outside Simcoe County through our 24 sites and other specialty publications, Village Media generates more than 30 million page views each month. While those numbers are impressive, quite honestly, they're not that important to me. Journalism is what's important to me. I like to think that at the local level, we are your eyes and ears at city council, at county council, at the school board, at the police services board, at the hospital, at the jail, in the arenas, in the boardrooms, wherever things that matter happen. It is our job to reflect the community. That means telling the stories of the disenfranchised, giving a voice to the voiceless. It means interpreting 100-page reports and breaking down financial analysis. It means listening. It means having hard conversations. It means being fearless. It's not easy and we're far from perfect but it is what we strive for every day. One of the ways we strive to be accountable to our community is through an advisory board composed of our readers. In the spring of 2023, we put out a call seeking six to 10 people from different segments of the community and from varied professional and personal backgrounds to sit on a new advisory board. The advisory board's mandate is to provide unbiased insights and ideas from a third party point of view. In short, we wanted to help build better relationships with people and group whose information needs may not be met. We always want to hear more voices about what we are doing right, as well as highlighting areas where we could do better. Journalism is a craft, and that means always learning and consistently wanting to improve. We were blown away with more than two dozen applications for our advisory board. It was not easy to whittle down that group to 10, but we did, and the group has met several times and has proven to be an invaluable resource for us. Members include a former First Nation chief, a former Arroyo City Council, a current Lakehead University professor, current Georgian and Lakehead students, a longtime business owner, among others. It is a great group of respected community leaders that helps ensure we fulfill our mandate. In closing, I would like to thank you for uh, listening today, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, from anyone. Thanks, Dave. That was awesome. Yeah, we'll just have a, a quick question period now. It looks like we already have some questions coming in. So Leanne asks, how do we support Aurelia Matters? Well, the best way to support us is to uh, read us. Um, it's so important that... Um, you know, our ad rates and different things are all kind of predicated on what our readership is and what we can, you know, show people. Um, so the more you can go to our site and read stories, that's the best way. Sign up for our newsletter. Um, that's something that's easy and free uh, as well. Um, and we also do accept donations. Like there's, it's funny, the support here is, is different than in some communities, but um, we're very fortunate. We have a number of packets, old packet subscribers, former packet subscribers, um, who continue to donate the amount of money they used to pay for a subscription to Aurelia Matters to support local journalism, which is just a phenomenal tribute, I think, um, to the past and an and investment in the future, which, you know, to us is just so meaningful. So that that's the uh, another way that you you can support us. Um, Fred Callen, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, asks, do subscription subscriptions bring in much funding? So we do not charge for subscriptions. So, okay. um, you know, we, we say we have 20,000 subscribers to our email, for example, and, um, but you don't have to pay for that. It's like I said earlier, um, we're really, it's really important to us that uh, everyone has equal uh, access to Aurelia Matters, and we will not charge for that. 
Trish um, asks a really great question saying, how can those who don't have digital access, including seniors, um, access local news such as Aurelia Matters? Yeah, that's a tough one for sure. Uh, we do have a, um, every one of our stories uh, has a option um, that you can have it read to you. Um, so if you're able to at least access the site, um, you can click on a story and just have it read to you. So you don't actually have to read it. Um, I know a, a lot of people have told me how much they appreciate that service. Um, they really uh, like that someone will read the stories to them. Um, so that is an option. That's really the only option that we we provide at this at this point in time, I guess. What should the owners of the packet have done to keep the packet up and running? That sounds like a, a nursery rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Well, I think I think what the owners did um, was they tried to keep one foot in the past mm -hmm. and then add a finger into the future. And so, you know, in the dying moments of the newspaper part of the world and the packet, for example, they were trying in very, uh, you know, in baby steps to have an online presence. I remember when uh, we were told to, I think, I think we were supposed to post the first two paragraphs of a story on our website to encourage people to buy the paper. <laughs> which of course just left people very frustrated uh, and didn't work, you know, and then we would publish all our stories to the website once the store, once the paper was printed. Um, so it was just a terrible disjointed strategy. Um, mm -hmm. This is not a surprise. This, this was a surprise to no one that our industry was going this way. Um, they just generally were reluctant to invest like if they just invested in some of the technology that our company did, um, there's no re there's never any reason to close a paper like the packet. Um, you know, they could have easily done both um, properly. Um, you know, they could have complemented one another, um, but they just, I mean, the problem was, and, and I think the other problem is it was absentee ownership, generally speaking. So they weren't in the community. They didn't, you know, when I'm in the community every day, I have people constantly coming up to me and asking me about certain things. You know, why didn't you do this? Why did you do this? Why don't you cover this? That kind of thing. Um, so we get that sense of what the community is talking about um, pretty clearly and quickly. But the absentee owners never felt that. You know, all they look at, and it's sad, but it's true, you know, was the bottom line. They were just trying to make more money. And the easiest way to do that is to cut salaries, to sell buildings, to, you know. Um, so it's, it's like, I have no sympathy for the owners of legacy media. I don't think they should get any breaks. I don't think the government should support them. I mean, this is com completely my opinion. Um, you know, they, they authored their own uh, story and, you know, that's, they could have done things so differently. I have another question here. Um, sorry. How do you grow the readership of Aurelia Matters? By writing great stories. Um, I mean, that's really, I think, you know, one of the things we could do better for sure is market ourselves, I think, um, because the people that read us every day seem very loyal and, and are um, really grateful and thankful for what we do. Um, but certainly there are some people that still don't want to exist. Um, so that's one of the things we're trying to do. Uh, I think like every one of us, uh, the names that I mentioned, each of the, each of us that work in our community here, we all volunteer heavily. Like I'm volunteer with multiple, multiple things. And so we always bring that with us as, as part of our identity. And, you know, we tell everyone that we meet and, you know, that we interact with and, um, we do try to promote the really matters as much as we can, uh, that way. Um, but I also kind of. It, I hearken it to the packet as an example, you know, we could never reach any, everyone that way either. Right. You just, it's, it's kind of impossible for any one medium to, to, to meet the needs of every person. Um, but I really think if we're doing our job and we're, we're telling those important stories, people in the community are going to be talking about it. They're going to 
talk to their friends, say, oh, did you see that story? And it really matters, uh, you know, or whatever. I think that's how we grow is by just doing our job as, as effectively uh, as possible. Yeah. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, I'll give it a couple more minutes if anyone has any final questions. Just while we're waiting, I would really just like to thank uh, people who do read us and support us. The, we have a level of support in our community that is so high um, and the engagement is so uh, awesome. Um, you know, we're really, really blessed by that. I think um, um, I just can't say enough about how, how supportive the community has been to us. Um, you know, when we're doing something right or something wrong we we do find out about it very very quickly um, because we're very connected and um and i think it's because you know our numbers are much higher for example than readership of our barry site and and that's you know barry is much bigger than us obviously but i think that speaks to you know not that we're doing a better job it speaks to how engaged um the community is in the community like they want to know what's going on they most of the people that live here are passionate very passionate about this community and what's going on um so anyway we're just very thankful for for that yeah. level of support so we have a, a viewer in from alberta today and they're asking what is the website how do we access that <laughs> reallymatters.com um you can just go there at any time a lot of people also i should have said they think that only news is happening when they get their email at 3 p.m. And our site, everyone should know, is updated constantly. So if there's a fire, if something's happening, it's posted immediately, generally speaking. Um, so please come and visit the site as often as you can, raymatters.com. Um, when you get a, a, when you subscribe to our daily email, you'll see that, you know, you'll get a list of all our headlines. You click on those headlines and they take you right to our site. Um, 